in the control valley. Uh, but the difference isn't really uh, statistically significant. So this mortality is a pretty rare outcome, so it can be hard to find an effect there. They also use um, sort of more sophisticated regression models that try to control for like seasonal effects and time trends and all these other things. Uh, but the basic conclusions that I just gave you right there are pretty much unchanged. So overall, uh, there does appear to be an impact of uh, hospitalizations on respiratory disease, but it's not so clear whether or not there's an effect on, uh, on mortality. So then another study that uh, I think is, is very nice uh, is kind of a twist on what Ransom and Pope did. And so this is by uh, Enrico Moretti, who's in the econ department here, and Matt Nadell. And they use essentially uh, daily variation in ozone levels uh, that are generated or that's generated by ship arrivals and departures in the Los Angeles and Long Beach ports. Um, so the idea here is that whether or not there are these big container ships arriving and departing at the ports is going to be uncorrelated with uh, factors that determine respiratory health after you control for the season and the day of week, uh, maybe the weather. So, okay, so let's think about like what, what they're doing here. Um, so they're saying, look, if there's lots of boats that are, there's a lot of boat traffic uh, arriving in the port, uh, then pollution levels tend to be higher than when there isn't a lot of boat traffic. The reason for that is that there isn't really any regulation on uh, what uh, the pollution levels from these boats have to be. So, you know, we, we very strongly regulate um, a lot of uh, pollution sources, like cars, for example. Uh, there's emissions control equipment today that is orders of magnitude better than what was on cars uh, in the 1960s or 1970s. Uh, it makes a huge difference. But for boats, uh, that's actually outside these big ships. It's basically outside the jurisdiction of the California Air Resources Board, um, which sets like state level policy. And so when these big boats arrive in Oakland or in um, in Los Angeles, it turns out they can generate a surprising amount of pollution. Because even though there's a few of them, they're really large and they have no pollution control equipment at all, and they burn really dirty fuel because you know most of the time you're at sea, so you don't really care whether or not the fuel is clean. Um, so you could actually think that having lots of boats arriving uh, could cause pollution levels to spike, and then that of course could have some effect on people's health. Now the one issue is that so if you think about like well, when are the boats arriving? Ideally, we'd like it to be kind of randomly assigned, right? Because we always want to get back to a situation in which we are um, trying to sort of simulate or replicate a randomized control trial. To some degree, it will be randomly assigned, but to some degree, there's also going to be a systematic component. So in particular, we're going to think that they arrive more often on weekdays than on weekends, because that's when the port is going to be busiest. Uh, and the season might also matter. I, I honestly don't know whether like, there's more sort of cargo traffic in the summer versus the winter, uh, but you could certainly imagine that there are like, seasonal effects as well. Um, so they want to they basically control for both the day of the week and the season to remove or to, to uh, uh, basically address any concerns that what you're picking up here is just that more boats arrive on weekdays, and that there are, like, say, more hospitalizations on weekdays just because the hospitals tend to be uh, you know, more open on weekdays. I mean, the hospitals are always, always open, but, um, uh, but there are going to be more doctors working there on weekdays than there are on weekends. Um, so they're going to control for these two specific things to sort of uh, uh, address those concerns. But after they control for those two specific things, then you could think that this boat traffic is pretty much random. Uh, and so you're getting basically random variation in pollution. You can see whether or not that uh, correlates with hospitalizations. So they're going to compare hospitalizations for these respiratory illnesses on days with high levels of boat traffic uh, and see how that compares to uh, the uh, hospitalizations uh, uh, for the same illnesses on days with low levels of boat traffic. Uh, another added benefit that they kind of um, uh, play up in the paper is that this can eliminate issues of avoidance behavior uh, because the boat traffic is not forced into, or is not uh, factored into the air quality forecast. So the idea behind avoidance behavior, this is something that like, economists really like to think about because as economists, we like to think about like, um, people's behavior uh, and how they sort of react uh, when faced with a different set of incentives. Uh, and so the idea here is that if you just look at, so let's say that, um, that pollution levels, uh, there, there's essentially no confounding in terms of the typical factors that, that we would uh, uh, think of. So we have uh, sort of daily variation in pollution levels, uh, and let's say that that daily variation in pollution levels is not correlated with other factors uh, that could affect people's health uh, and thus affect their hospitalizations. So even in that scenario, if people uh, know or people are aware of what the, the daily pollution level is going to be, so if there's like a forecast, which there is, um, that's how we decide whether or not we're going to do a scarier day. So if people know what the forecast is going to be, uh, and if they know that they're like vulnerable to say getting asthma on high pollution days, uh, then they can take steps to try to avoid uh, engaging in activities that, that might uh, result in an asthmatic attack, right? So maybe normally you go running or something, but if there's a, a, a forecast that says it's going to be a really high pollution day, uh, you decide to sort of stay indoors that day and take it easy and you don't run. And so because of that avoidance behavior, in some sense you're going to underestimate the effect of pollution exposure on uh, on health, right? Because um, if people weren't engaging in it, then they would uh, uh, then they would fall sick. But because they're specifically avoiding contact with pollution, uh, they, they they are able to avoid having you know asthmatic attacks or something like that. Uh, now, how do you want to view that? Like how you want to view that type of behavior in interpreting the effects uh, is not totally clear. So on the one hand, you could say, well, um, you know, that's fine. People can sort of take measures or take uh, undergo um, uh, activities that help them uh, stay healthy when, uh, when the pollution level spikes. And that will sort of all be folded into the actual effect on, of uh, pollution on hospitalizations. So you don't want to, like if you're a policymaker and you're, you're saying, well, what would happen if I were to reduce pollution levels by this amount, given that currently we have this pollution forecast and people you know, take measures to avoid exposing themselves to pollution on high pollution days, uh, the answer would be, well, you know, um, the hospitalizations probably won't fall that much because people are already sort of engaging in these measures to, uh, to uh, avoid uh, ending up in the hospital in those days. And that, that would be like the correct estimate. You know, as a policymaker, that would, that would sort of be um, uh, telling you what you actually want to know. So that, that would be sort of an argument for not uh, trying to do anything about uh, adjusting for this avoidance behavior. The counter argument, though, would be that what we should be sort of overall concerned about is like people's utility or people's welfare. And Clearly, ending up in the hospital is something that has a negative effect on utility and a negative effect on welfare. That's why the policymaker would be trying to avoid it. But engaging in avoidance behavior is also something that has a negative effect on utility, right? And so the counter argument would essentially be, look, maybe you're not finding an effect of, um, of air pollution on hospitalizations because of this avoidance behavior, but that doesn't mean that there isn't some costly uh, impact or co negative impact on utility from air pollution. It's just that the impact now is that people can't go outside rather than the impact being that they uh, end up in the hospital. Um, so for that reason, you might want to sort of uh, try to estimate the effect uh, of air pollution while holding this uh, avoidance behavior constant basically not allowing people to engage in the avoidance behavior. And it turns out that their study basically allows them to do that because uh, the boat traffic isn't factored into the air quality forecast, right? So the story is that normally uh, with a normal spike in air quality or spike in air pollution, people see, uh, people who are vulnerable are watching the forecast, they see that the, the forecast goes up and then they modify their behavior. But when you get a spike in air pollution because of this boat traffic, which is what they're using to estimate their effects, uh, the people who are watching the air quality forecast won't actually see anything because it doesn't appear in, in the, uh, the forecast at all.
normally we so normally we would say if we're dealing with dollar values, we'd say that you know if you're risk neutral, then you have uh, you're indifferent between say receiving hundred dollars versus having a one in ten chance to win thousand uh, dollars. Here we're talking about like hospitalizations versus no hospitalizations. But even if you're somebody who maybe we're not so um, averse to ending up in the hospital, uh, you still might engage in some sort of avoidance behavior just because you still get some negative utility out of ending up in the hospital, right? So if you if you could take some small step, if you knew the air pollution was going to spike and you could take some small step to avoid it, uh, then you might take that step uh, to avoid ending up in the hospital. So. What they find, uh, or what they, what they identify here is sort of variation air pollution that's not going to be factored into the, the air quality forecast. And so that basically eliminates the ability of people to, um, to uh, react and try to say, stay inside. Uh, you know, I guess you can tell a story where all the people who care about air quality understand that boat traffic is also a major source of, uh, of variation in air quality. And so they've got somebody down at the port counting the number of boats coming in. Uh, but I think that's probably unlikely. So what the paper finds, uh, the result is that, uh, that ozone does seem to uh, cause significant changes in hospitalizations for respiratory illnesses. So a, um, the basic result is that there's a 500,000 ton increase in boat traffic that day. You see about a 60% increase in local ozone levels. So again, this is quite large. I mean, I don't remember exactly what 500,000 tons compares to in terms of the average, uh, but it's probably something like one standard deviation of the average or something like this. So, uh, so the, um, there's some uh, average, number, average amount of boat traffic per day, which is measured in uh, basically thousands of tons. Uh, so like each boat has a certain displacement of a certain gross tonnage or something, right? And so you're adding up the number of boats times like the average number of tons. Uh, so this is just saying if you add uh, enough boats that it adds up to 500,000 extra, yeah, 500,000 extra tons of traffic for that particular day, then on that day you would see. Right. So I'm saying that uh, I'll have to go look it up, but I'm guessing that's probably something like a 20 or 30 or 40 percent increase in uh, boat traffic that you're talking about there, and that increases local ozone levels by like about 60 percent. So I mean that's 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 a huge uh, amount to be honest, uh, and it really basically speaks to uh, the importance of somehow overcoming this like jurisdictional thing where the state is not able to regulate uh, the amount of boat traffic. Because you know what it, what it means is like there's probably very low cost ways to substantially reduce ozone pollution by just forcing these boats to like not run their main engines and have some sort of cleaner backup generator or something. Uh, but the state can't go down that avenue. They're, they're, that's not sort of a policy option that's uh, uh, available to them. Instead, they have to sort of try to squeeze ever more out of it or ever more pollution reduction out of like cars by having like electric cars, which are very expensive. Or you know our special blend of gasoline, which as we can see right now is also potentially expensive because our gas prices have spiked by a dollar. I mean it's not that it's inherently expensive, but it basically uh, makes us more vulnerable to supply shocks because we can't sort of uh, trade on the, the greater national market. Um, so anyway, so, so changes in, in boat traffic actually cause really large changes uh, in ozone levels, and those large changes in ozone levels uh, are accompanied by increases in uh, local hospitalization. So you basically have 60%, you have a whole bunch of extra boats coming in that day. What happens is there's a 60% increase in ozone uh, and an accompanying about 11% increase in uh, local hospitalizations. So the elasticity there would be about like 0.2 or 10% change in ozone levels, results in about a 2% change in respiratory hospitalizations. And it turns out that this effect is larger than what you would find when just looking at the raw correlation between uh, ozone levels and respiratory hospitalizations. So this is suggestive evidence of their story about this sort of avoidance behavior, right? Normally, when there's a spike in uh, ozone levels, people know about it because it's in the air quality forecast, and they might sort of take measures to, to avoid ending up in the hospital. Uh, but when these boats all come in and there's spike in ozone levels, nobody knows about it, so there can't be any avoidance behavior. Um, okay. So there's strong evidence that all of this, like, short-term variation in air pollution uh, does have an effect on, say, hospitalizations. Uh, but... In, in some cases, you can even just find some effect on, say, mortality. Uh, but the problem with using short-term variation in air pollution levels to estimate the mortality results or mortality effects is that there's this phenomenon which is called uh, harvesting. Um, so, the, so the sort of if you were to run a study where you look at, uh, say, the relationship between the spike in air pollution and mortality, there's two possible outcomes, right? One outcome is you don't find any relationship. So the problem with, with that is that you can't conclude that there's no effect, right? With a null effect, all you can uh, say is that either there wasn't an effect or that the exposure period was too short to generate an effect because we're only looking at short-term changes in pollution. On the other hand, there's a possibility that you might find a significant effect. So you, you might see that, say, when a whole bunch of boats come in, ozone levels rise, and then mortality increases. If that were the case, uh, that doesn't actually prove that there's like a meaningful effect of air pollution on mortality, because you might postulate that that effect just represents what we call harvesting. So the idea behind harvesting is that different individuals have like different susceptibility to um, dying from air pollution. So in particular, it's almost really going to be the case that uh, who you would think of as the weakest individuals, so basically people who are very old or people who are very sick, or are very sick, particularly if they have some sort of like heart disease or lung disease or something like that. Those are the people who you think are going to be the most likely to be affected by a short-term spike uh, in air pollution levels. But the problem is that those are also people who are likely to have died relatively soon, even in the absence of an air pollution uh, uh, spike. So, you know, you can sort of think of somebody who's like really like in bad shape. They're uh, sort of on the margin of dying, uh, and then you have this negative shock to them in the form of the spike in air pollution, and that basically pushes them over the edge, and then unfortunately they die. But the question is, okay, well, what would the counterfactual be uh, if there hadn't been the pollution spike? Is it they would have sort of like suddenly gotten better and gone on to lead you know a healthy life for another twenty years? In some cases that might be possible, but that's rarely going to be the case. Usually the counterfactual is like, well, they would continue to get worse, and then maybe they would have died two months later or something like that, right? So if that's going on, then the net effect of the air pollution increase on uh, life years lost can be minimal um, because you don't, basically what you've done is you sort of brought up somebody's death by like a few months. You haven't brought it up by say 10 or 20 years. Uh, and so trying to figure out whether, whether this harvesting effect is uh, operating and how it's affecting your estimates uh, can be really difficult. Um, okay, well, I'm just gonna, let's stop here since we're almost out of time. Uh, and I'll just finish up very quickly on Monday with the, the little evidence that we do have on what the relationship between long-term exposure to air pollution is on uh, mortality. Mm -hmm.